Hello again, everyone. My name is Greg Fritz. I'm a doctor of physical therapy and a practicing clinician in the northwest of Washington State. I own three different outpatient physical therapy clinics, as well as an imaging company called Echo Health that I provide critical diagnostic imaging to my colleagues. I want to take an opportunity to thank Clarius Mobile Health for providing me with this platform to bring information regarding musculoskeletal ultrasound imaging, particularly at the point of care of our own clinics. And this is a second video in a three-part series that I'm hoping to educate my own occupation group to the use of diagnostic ultrasound imaging in our practice. The first video is entitled, The What? I encourage you to take a look at it. It does briefly outline how ultrasound fits into the imaging modalities in our practice. And it also gives you some identification of what structures look like uh, in the body under an ultrasound view. This particular video, I am hoping to platform our process of identifying the working diagnosis. And so I have provided a subtitle to the why, being eight differential diagnosis questions answered. And I'd like to spend some time talking about how we get to a working diagnosis, and that involves going through the differential diagnostic process. Known as history taking, good clinicians begin to realize that it is during this process that they can start to itemize in their own mind or on paper the list of chief complaints. And from that list of chief complaints, they can begin to develop what they believe to be possible diagnoses. There's two different strategies that have been identified for coming up with these possible diagnoses, and the first of which is simply pattern recognition. Much like computer machine learning, clinicians have gone through enough exposure to various diagnoses or various chief complaints that they can put together their best guess as to what the diagnosis could be. The second strategy involves scientific hypothesis, and that's where we simply evaluate could it be this, could it be that, through various testings. Once we get a list of possible diagnoses, we then do critical reasoning and testing to challenge those diagnoses and attempt to rule them out or rule them in. In physical therapy, we use manual testing like muscle strength testing, joint stability testing, or evaluating a person's gait. But the whole goal remains the same, and that is how do we get down to our working diagnosis with the best accuracy? because it is in clearly working out what that working diagnosis is that we are able to obtain the best outcomes. And I'm proposing for your consideration that musculoskeletal ultrasound imaging can be used very well to uncover what that diagnosis is. There are eight different areas that I would like to focus the value of ultrasound imaging on. One is the question of, is it involving the tendon and ligament support structures? Are there lesions to that complex? Two, is the bone support sound? Do we have fractures? Is there any issues that we should be aware of? Three, in what phase of the inflammatory continuum is this patient in? That helps us to address what intervention is the most sound and appropriate. Four, what level are we dealing with of degenerative arthritis? Five, can we discern whether or not this symptom profile is coming from a structure, like let's say a rotator cuff tear, or is that pain and weakness coming from a nerve issue, like a cervical spine pathology? Number six, is the patient utilizing the appropriate motor control strategies to accomplish a specific task, whether that's the VMO, whether that's the serratus anterior, whether it's pelvic floor contraction, ultrasound imaging can allow us a window into whether or not our patients are activating the right muscles and even in the right sequence. Number seven, probably one of my most favorite ones and the ones that I have the most case studies on. And that is when a patient comes in and says, what is this? 
the answer that we're able to actually show the patient under ultrasound imaging has credibility that's beyond amazing. And lastly, as we take a look at, is this healing happening correctly? Do we see remodeling? Or is there continuing indications that there's an infection process going on? I would like to first begin with evaluating the tendon and ligament complex. As we take a look at the tendon and ligament pathology, we have to ask ourselves important questions. Is there a compromise in the support structure? Meaning, is there evidence that the collagen fibers that make up ligaments and tendons are sound? When there's pathology in this collagen structure, there is a histological change, a metabolic process that we're actually able to evaluate through ultrasound imaging. So we can actually determine, is this a sprain strain or is there a fracture of collagen filaments? And if we do see a fracture of the fibers in the tendon or ligament, is that tear partial or is it complete? And so I've selected a case study that demonstrates the use of ultrasound imaging to critically assess the integrity of support structures. I'm choosing a left knee pain patient that I had come into my office about five months ago. It was a 45-year-old female who was on a skiing vacation at a resort in Canada just north of us here. She said that she was actually queuing in the ski lift when she caught the tip of her ski under the ski in front of her. She was unable to catch her balance as she slowly fell to the side and she felt a snap in the outside of her left knee. She immediately felt pain that increased with weight bearing, but her biggest concern was when she was standing and trying to turn on the foot, there was some instability that she felt. She did claim that when she extended her knee completely was when she had the most pain and that she only had minimal to moderate swelling at the time. Her husband drove her to the urgent care center in the town nearby where they manually tested the joint, did some x-rays, they did not see any injuries, and placed her in an extension brace along with some oral non-steroidal medication. They advised her to go to see her physician, which she did, and he sent her to see me now three to four weeks after the actual injury. On my examination, I did not see any discoloration, and with palpation to the knee, I didn't find any edema or any swelling, but I did notice that there was quite a bit of tenderness near the fibular head and also into the lateral collateral ligament and that entire complex was exquisitely tender to pressure. I then advanced into the manual testing component and found that when I was doing varus testing there was a softer end feel and that she began to report that she was feeling nauseous and a little bit lightheaded. I continued with testing the stability of the knee, doing the cruciate ligaments, and found them to be quite stable, and did as much meniscal testing as I could, because with the torsion, there was quite a bit of instability. I placed the knee through full range of motion without a lot of limitation. I also tested for strength, but with her level of anxiety and apprehension, I was only able to get three to a three plus uh, strength. So I would like to start with orienting you to the anatomy of the knee without the skin on it. And as you know, the kneecap is going to be located just below the quad tendon and above the patellar tendon. But on either side, this structure in here and off to the lateral aspect here, that's part of the capsule that we're able to see. However, if you take a look at this image here, you can see that that capsule extends all the way up under the quadriceps in an area we refer to as the suprapatellar pouch or the recess. And as you can see here, normally that capsular tissue is very foldy, kind of like a too large stocking. And it's meant to be that way so that we can bend the knee as far as we can and straighten the knee out without challenging that structure. We're going to be placing the probe vertically over the kneecap and horizontally over the kneecap to best identify how much fluid is actually in that capsule. Because if we can identify whether or not there's an inflammatory process intra-articularly, we can critically evaluate what part the diagnosis might have that involves that tissue. I've demonstrated here a dashed 
red line, that's going to be where we're going to slice that knee when we do a view that you see to the top left. And that capsule that we talked about over on the right and down here by the patella is the green area on this particular image. The area that we refer to as the suprapatellar pouch is located just above the kneecap. We're going to now move to the actual image that we saw on the top left. I'm going to orient you to the kneecap, to the quad tendon, to the femur. And I'm going to show you here that when that area of the capsule gets inflamed, it will puff up like, like wine in a wineskin. And that pathology inside the articular structures creates effusion. When that structure gets filled up, that structure goes all the way up into the area of the quad tendon. I'm going to overlay onto this image an actual ultrasound image that I've taken and I've placed the anatomy in the correct locations. You'll see that there is fluid that goes up under the quadricep tendon and that fluid is a telltale sign that there's additional pathology that exists intra-articularly. I'm going to now move to the actual images and the videos of slicing that knee in the patient whose case study we're looking at. Represented again on the left is that view of what the fluid would look like in this case. It would be extending well under the quad tendon. But as we hit start here, you're going to see that the quad tendon is quite well preserved. And underneath that, that dark area is biological fluid that does exist. This is the prefemoral fat pad. This is the suprapatellar fat pad. And this is your quad muscle up in the top left. If we now go to the horizontal view, you're already starting to see this is the rectus femoris muscle. This is the vastus muscle on either side. This is subcutaneous fat, and you'll be able to watch the structure move underneath as we go. That's the end of the rectus femoris. It starts to form the quadricep tendon here, and you can see the trochlear groove and the articular cartilage represented by the darkness here. This is the quad tendon here. I showed you this because the patient in the case study demonstrated no intra-articular effusion, nothing that would make us think ACL, meniscus, osteochondral defect, or anything else that may be helpful in identifying what is the actual working diagnosis here. And so now after clearing the internal articular region for pathology, we're going to move on to take a look at the structures on the lateral aspect of the left knee. This video you're going to be watching now basically shows a uh, highlight of the region where she was having pain and it's going to bring that image closer to you and m expose the structures of support that are underneath the zone where she had most of her discomfort. You're going to see here that this is the lateral meniscus this is the popliteal tendon coming from the popliteus muscle. And this is the biceps femoris that comes down, spans the lateral joint, and attaches to the fibular head. This is the lateral collateral ligament that goes from the lateral condyle across the popliteal tendon, across the meniscus, over the tibia, and attaches as well onto the fibular head. So when we do take a look at the first image that's going to be showing up now, You'll see that the fibular head is off to the right here. This is the tibia, and this is the distal lateral femur. And you're going to take a look at the fibers coming from the biceps femoris when we take a look at the video starting now. You'll see that from the top left of the screen, the fibers, the long strand collagen fibers coming from the muscle structure that's up here a ways, comes down and it starts to go apart and attach itself to the fibular head. Now, though we see a little bit of darkening in this area here, which could represent some fiber strain, we don't see an overt swelling or darkness of fluid that exists there. So what we're going to do next is take a look at the structure of the biceps femoris tendon, and you're going to then see that we're going to move the probe in a counterclockwise direction to go over the top of the lateral collateral ligament. 
we begin with taking a look at the biceps femoris tendon going into the fibular head. And from there, you will see coming into view the femur, again fibular head, and the long strand structure of the lateral collateral ligament. This is the popliteus tendon running under the lateral collateral ligament, and this is the fiber of the LCL attaching to the lateral condyle of the femur. So here we see the fibers of the lateral collateral ligament, but we also see something showing up here down at the end. There is clearly a cleft between the fibers of the lateral collateral ligament and the continuation of fibers to the fibular head. And so we move on to evaluating just the lateral collateral ligament. We're looking for signs of inflammation to identify where along that ligament the injury is most likely. When the body is irritated, when something is torn, the body does create fluid in the region. And that fluid can show up on ultrasound as darkness. So it is literally as simple as placing the probe over the area of pain and looking for darkness. So we're going to now take a look at the actual structure of the lateral collateral ligament. Remembering this is the fibular head, this is the femur, this is the popliteus tendon. As the video plays, you'll see the fibers of the lateral collateral ligament attaching to the lateral condyle. You'll see beginning to develop over the lateral collateral ligament in the distal component some darkness, some area of fluid. You'll also see, as this video winds down, that that fluid corresponds to areas in the fiber of the lateral collateral ligament that have been compromised. You'll see almost a stub-like formation here on part of the lateral collateral ligament, and that corresponds nicely to the darkness of fluid. However, it's not just fluid that ultrasound is able to identify. We can overlay on the images that are coming from our scanner a tool that allows us to identify if there is excess blood flow or new blood flow to a region. We know the collagen fibers of the tendon structure and of ligament structures do not have microvasculature to them. So, if there is blood flow within that fibrous complex, that is an inflammatory event. So we're going to be taking this zone. We know the lesion is in the lower aspect of the lateral collateral ligament. We know that fluid is existing in this region as well. But we're going to overlay onto that a slice image that does have a zone, which you're seeing show up here in a yellow square, that will be interpreting blood flow. And you're already seeing a teaser here. This is the lateral collateral ligament. This is the biceps femoris tendon. It's cut in an axial fashion or short axis. And you'll see as I turn on the video, there is excess blood flow between those two structures. Not just excess blood flow, there is blood flow, and that is an inflammatory event. So we have the ability so far to show you that there is a lesion. It's in the distal component of the lateral collateral ligament, and it's in a process of inflammatory correction for healing. So... In category number one, which is support structures, these are the questions that I've been able to answer regarding my patient. Question number one, is there inner joint pathology? Well, by looking at the suprapatellar pouch, we were able to determine that it's not presently an acute inflammatory event, so the odds are very low. Through manual testing, I've been able to identify that there was some static support compromise, but can we identify the culpable structure? Yes, we can. It was the lateral collateral ligament. But are we able to determine if it's just a sprain strain, or is there evidence that the fibers have been breached? Well, you and I both saw that the fibers were torn. Was it a full tear? 
or a partial tear. Now, I've got to be honest, it's inconclusive to me, though you and I both saw that there was some fiber retraction. As I scanned through it, it was not complete. And so I was not able to see a complete flopping around retraction. So I feel I cannot come to the point of where I'm saying it's conclusive. Is there reason to consider MRI or a surgical consult? Well, in my opinion, there was. There was instability, there was a vasovagal response because of that instability, and there is evidence, in my opinion, to put into gold standard imaging the actual pathology. Was there any bony involvement? And true to the x-rays that they took, I did not see any of that in this imaging. What phase of healing are we in? Well, you and I saw that via the power Doppler, this is the inflammatory phase. This is where tissue is, the body is bringing fluid in and taking toxins out. So the question of what is the direction of our care? I'm sending her for a surgical consult to rule out any critical instability, but I am providing her home exercises to strengthen the adjacent joints. I'm keeping her moving those joints, and I'm also allowing her to utilize a supportive structure, be it a neoprene sleeve or even the extension splint, if she finds that to be valuable. I hope this case study has helped you better understand how musculoskeletal point-of-care ultrasound in the practice of physical therapy can be used to help refine down a differential diagnosis list into a more focused working diagnosis. This patient went on, did get an MRI, which documented about 75% failure of her lateral collateral ligament, but the surgeon felt confident that there was enough fiber that remained to allow her to continue to function with stability over time. After this good example of how ultrasound can be used to identify pathology in support structures, I want to move on in the next case study demonstrating how we can use this tool to identify bony integrity. Thank you for joining me this time, and I appreciate you open-mindedly considering the use of ultrasound imaging in your practice.